which with the next dawn was to break beneath her and wash her, spent, amazed and uncomprehending, into the shuttered room where she died two years later. The Christmas Eve, the explosion, and none to ever know just why or just what happened between Henry and his father, and only the cabin-to-cabin -cabin whispering of Negroes to spread the news that Henry and Bon had ridden away in the dark, and that Henry had formally abjured his home and birthright. They went to New Orleans. They rode through the bright cold of that Christmas day to the river and took the steamboat. It was still Henry doing the leading, the bringing, as he always did until the very last, when for the first time during their entire relationship, Bon led and Henry followed. He didn't have to go. He had voluntarily made himself a pauper, but he could have gone to his grandfather, since although he was probably better mounted than any other at the university, not excepting Bon himself, he probably had very little money beyond what he could raise hurriedly on his horse and what valuables he happened to have on his body when he and Bon rode away. No, he didn't have to go, and he doing the leading this time too, and Bon riding beside him, trying to find out from him what had happened. Bon knew, of course, what Sutpin had discovered in New Orleans, but he would need to know just what, just how much, Sutpin had told Henry, and Henry not telling him, doubtless with the new mayor, which he probably knew he would have to surrender, sacrifice to, along with all the rest of his life, inheritance, going fast now, and his back rigid and irrevocably turned upon the house, his birthplace and all the familiar scenes of his childhood and youth which he had repudiated for the sake of that friend with whom, despite the sacrifice which he had just made out of love and loyalty, he could still not be perfectly frank. Because he knew that what Sutpin had told him was true, he must have known that at the very instant when he gave his father the lie. So he dared not ask Bon to deny it. He dared not, you see. He could face poverty, disinheritance, but he could not have borne that lie from Bon. Yet he went to New Orleans. He went straight there to the only place, the very place, where he could not help but prove conclusively the very statement which, coming from his father, he had called a lie. He went there for that purpose. He went there to prove it. And Bon, riding beside him, trying to find out what Sutpin had told him, Bon, who for a year and a half now had been watching Henry ape his clothing and speech, who for a year and a half now had seen himself as the object of that complete and abnegant devotion which only a youth, never a woman, gives to another youth or a man, who for exactly a year now had seen the sister succumb to that same spell which the brother had already succumbed to, and this with no volition on the seducer's part, without so much as the lifting of a finger, as though it actually were the brother who had put the spell on the sister, seduced her to his own vicarious image which walked and breathed with Barnes' body. Yet here is the letter sent four years afterward written on a sheet of paper salvaged from a gutted house in Carolina with stove polish found in some captured Yankee stores, four years after she had had any message from him save the messages from Henry that he, Bon, was still alive. So whether Henry now knew about the other woman or not, he would now have to know. Bon realized that. I can imagine them as they rode, Henry still in the fierce, repercussive flush of vindicated loyalty, and Bon, the wiser, the shrewder, even if only from wider experience and a few more years of age, learning from Henry without Henry's being aware of it, what Sutpin had told him, because Henry would have to know now. And I don't believe it was just to preserve Henry as an ally, for the crisis of some future need. It was because Bon not only loved Judith after his fashion, but he loved Henry, too, and I believe in a deeper sense than merely after his fashion. Perhaps in his fatalism he loved Henry the better of the two, seeing perhaps in the sister merely the shadow, 
the woman vessel with which to consummate the love whose actual object was the youth. This cerebral Don Juan, who, reversing the order, had learned to love what he had injured, perhaps it was even more than Judith or Henry either, perhaps the life, the existence which they represented, because who knows what picture of peace he might have seen in that monotonous provincial backwater, what alleviation and escape for a parched traveler who had traveled too far at too young an age in this granite-bound and simple country spring. And I can imagine how Bond told Henry, broke it to him. I can imagine Henry in New Orleans, who had not even yet been to Memphis, whose entire worldly experience consisted of sojourns at other houses, plantations, almost interchangeable with his own, where he followed the same routine which he did at home, the same hunting and cockfighting, the same amateur racing of horses on crude homemade tracks, horses sound enough in blood and lineage, yet not bred to race and perhaps not even thirty minutes out of the shafts of a trap or perhaps even a carriage, the same square dancing with identical and also interchangeable provincial virgins to music exactly like that at home, the same champagne, the best doubtless yet crudely dispensed out of the burlesque pantomime elegance of negro butlers who, and likewise the drinkers who gulped it down like neat whiskey between flowery and unsubtle toasts, would have treated lemonade the same way. I can imagine him with his Puritan heritage, that heritage peculiarly Anglo-Saxon, of fierce, proud mysticism, and that ability to be ashamed of ignorance and inexperience, in that city foreign and paradoxical, with its atmosphere at once fatal and languorous, at once feminine and steel-hard, this grim, humorless yokel out of a granite heritage where even the houses, let alone clothing and conduct, are built in the image of a jealous and sadistic Jehovah, put suddenly down in a place whose denizens had created their all-powerful and his supporting hierarchy chorus of beautiful saints and handsome angels in the image of their houses and personal ornaments and voluptuous lives. Yes, I can imagine how Bond led up to it, to the shark. The skill, the calculation, preparing Henry's Puritan mind as he would have prepared a cramped and rocky field and planted it and raised the crop which he wanted. It would be the fact of the ceremony, regardless of what kind, that Henry would balk at. Bond knew this. It would not be the mistress or even the child, not even the negro mistress, and even less the child because of that fact since Henry and Judith had grown up with a negro half-sister of their own. Not the mistress to Henry, certainly not the nigger mistress to a youth with Henry's background, a young man grown up and living in a milieu where the other sex is separated into three sharp divisions, separated two of them by a chasm which could be crossed but one time and in but one direction, ladies, women, females. The virgins, whom gentlemen someday married, the courtesans, to whom they went while on sabbaticals to the cities, the slave girls and women upon whom that first caste rested, and to whom in certain cases it doubtless owed the very fact of its virginity. Not this to Henry, young, strong-blooded, victim of the hard celibacy of riding and hunting, to heat and make importunate the blood of a young man, to which he and his kind were forced to pass time away, with girls of his own class interdict and inaccessible, and women of the second class just as inaccessible because of money and distance, and hence only the slave girls, the housemaids neated and cleaned by white mistresses, or perhaps girls with sweating bodies out of the fields themselves, and the young man rides up and beckons the watching overseer and says, Send me Juno, or Missilina, or Clory, and then rides on into the trees and dismounts and waits. No, it would be the ceremony, a ceremony entered into, to be sure, with a negro, yet still a ceremony. This is what Bond doubtless thought. So I can imagine him the way he did it, 
the way in which he took the innocent and negative plate of Henry's provincial soul and intellect and exposed it by slow degrees to this esoteric milieu, building gradually toward the picture which he desired it to retain, accept, I can see him corrupting Henry gradually into the purlieus of elegance, with no foreword, no warning, the postulation to come after the fact, exposing Henry slowly to the surface aspect, the architecture a little curious, a little femininely flamboyant, and therefore to Henry opulent, sensuous, sinful, the inference of great and easy wealth measured by steamboat loads in place of a tedious inching of sweating human figures across cotton fields, the flash and glitter of a myriad carriage wheels in which women, enthroned and immobile and passing rapidly across the vision, appeared like painted portraits beside men in linen a little finer and diamonds a little brighter and in broadcloth a little trimmer, and with hats raked a little more above faces, a little more darkly swaggering than any Henry had ever seen before. And the mentor, the man for whose sake he had repudiated not only blood and kin, but food and shelter and clothing, too, whose clothing and walk and speech he had tried to ape, along with his attitude toward women and his ideas of honor and pride, too, watching him with that cold and cat-like inscrutable calculation, watching the picture resolve and become fixed, and then telling Henry, but that's not it, that's just the base, the foundation. It can belong to anyone. And Henry, you mean this is not it? That it is above this, higher than this, more select than this? And Barn, yes. This is only the foundation. This belongs to anybody. A dialogue without words, speech, which would fix and then remove without obliterating one line the picture, this background, leaving the background, the plate prepared and innocent again, the plate docile with that Puritan's humility toward anything, which is a matter of sense rather than logic, fact, the man, the struggling and suffocating heart behind it, saying, I will believe, I will, I will, whether it is true or not, I will believe, waiting for the next picture which the mentor, the corrupter, intended for it. That next picture, following the fixation and acceptance of which the mentor would say again, perhaps with words now, still watching the sober and thoughtful face, but still secure in his knowledge and trust in that Puritan heritage, which must show disapproval instead of surprise or even despair, and nothing at all rather than have the disapprobation construed as surprise or despair. But not even this is it. And Henry, you mean it is still higher than this, still above this? Because he, Bon, would be talking now, lazily, almost cryptically, stroking onto the plate himself now, the picture which he wanted there. I can imagine how he did it. The calculation, the surgeon's alertness and cold detachment, the exposure's brief, so brief as to be cryptic, almost staccato, the plate unaware of what the complete picture would show, scarce seen yet ineradicable. A trap, a riding horse standing before a closed and curiously monastic doorway in a neighborhood a little decadent, even a little sinister, and Bon mentioning the owner's name casually, this corruption subtly anew by putting into Henry's mind the notion of one man of the world speaking to another, that Henry knew that Bon believed that Henry would know even from a disjointed word what Bon was talking about. And Henry, the Puritan, who must show nothing at all rather than surprise or incomprehension. A facade shuttered and blank, drowsing in steamy morning sunlight, invested by the bland and cryptic voice with something of secret and curious and unimaginable delight. Without his knowing what he saw, it was as though to Henry 
The blank and scaling barrier in dissolving produced and revealed not comprehension to the mind, the intellect, which weighs and discards, but striking instead, straight and true, to some primary blind and mindless foundation of all young male living dream and hope. A row of faces like a bazaar of flowers, the supreme apotheosis of chattelry, of human flesh bred of the two races for that sale, a corridor of doomed and tragic flower faces walled between the grim duenia row of old women and the elegant shapes of young men, trim, predatory, and at the moment, goat-like. This seen by Henry quickly, exposed quickly and then removed, the mentor's voice still bland, pleasant, cryptic, postulating still the fact of one man of the world talking to another about something they both understood, depending upon, counting upon still the Puritan's provincial horror of revealing surprise or ignorance, who knew Henry so much better than Henry knew him, and Henry not showing either, suppressing still that first cry of terror and grief, I will believe, I will, I will. Yes, that brief, before Henry had had time to know what he had seen, but now slowing, now would come the instant for which Bon had builded, a wall unscalable, a gate ponderously locked, the sober and thoughtful country youth just waiting, looking, not yet asking why or what, the gate of solid beams in place of the lace-like iron grilling, and they passing on. Bon knocking at a small adjacent doorway from which a swarthy man resembling a creature out of an old woodcut of the French Revolution erupts, concerned even a little aghast, looking first at the daylight and then at Henry and speaking to Bon in French, which Henry does not understand, and Bon's teeth glinting for an instant before he answers in French, with him, an American, he is a guest. I would have to let him choose weapons, and I decline to fight with axes. No, no, not that. Just the key. Just the key. And now the solid gates closed behind them instead of before. No sight or evidence above the high, thick walls of the low city, and scarce any sound of it. The labyrinthine mass of oleander and jasmine, lantana and mimosa, Walling yet again the strip of bare earth, combed and curried with powdered shell, raked and immaculate, and only the most recent of the brown stains showing now, and the voice, the mentor, the guide, standing aside now to watch the grave provincial face, casually and pleasantly anecdotal. The customary way is to stand back to back the pistol in your right hand and the corner of the other cloak in your left. Then at the signal, you begin to walk, and when you feel the cloak tauten, you turn and fire. Though there are some now and then when the blood is especially hot, or when it is still peasant blood, who prefer knives and one cloak. They face one another inside the same cloak, you see, each holding the other's wrist with the left hand. But that was never my way. Casual, chatty, you see, waiting for the countryman's slow question, who knew already now before he asked it, what would you, they, be fighting for? Yes, Henry would know now, or believe that he knew now. Any more, he would probably consider anticlimax, though it would not be. It would be anything but that. The final blow, stroke, touch, the keen surgeon-like compounding which the now shocked nerves of the patient would not even feel, not know that the first hard shocks were the random and crude. Because there was that ceremony, Bond knew that that would be what Henry would resist, find hard to stomach and retain. Oh, he was shrewd, this man whom for weeks now Henry was realizing that he knew less and less, this stranger immersed and oblivious now in the formal, almost ritual preparation for the visit, 
finicking, almost like a woman, over the fit of the new coat which he would have ordered for Henry, forced Henry to accept for this occasion, by means of which the entire impression which Henry was to receive from the visit would be established before they even left the house, before Henry ever saw the woman. And Henry, the countryman, the bewildered, with the subtle tide already setting beneath him toward the point where he must either betray himself and his entire upbringing and thinking, or deny the friend for whom he had already repudiated home and kin and all. The bewildered, the for that time helpless, who wanted to believe yet did not see how he could, being carried by the friend, the mentor, through one of those inscrutable and curiously lifeless doorways, like that before which he had seen the horse or the trap, and so into a place which to his Puritan's provincial mind all of morality was upside down and all of honor perished, a place created for and by voluptuousness, the abashless and unabashed senses, and the country boy with his simple and erstwhile untroubled code in which females were ladies or whores or slaves, looked at the apotheosis of two doomed races presided over by its own victim, a woman with a face like a tragic magnolia, the eternal female, the eternal who suffers, the child, the boy, sleeping in silk and lace to be sure, yet complete chattel of him who, begetting him, owned him body and soul to sell, if he chose, like a calf or puppy or sheep and the mentor watching again, perhaps even the gambler now thinking, have I won or lost, as they emerged and returned to Bond's rooms, for that while impotent even with talk, shrewdness, no longer counting upon that Puritan character which must show neither surprise nor despair, having to count now, if on anything, on the corruption itself, the love, he could not even say, well, what do you say about it? He could only wait, and that upon the absolutely unpredictable actions of a man who lived by instinct and not reason, until Henry should speak, but a bought woman, a whore, and Bon, even gently now, not whore, don't say that. In fact, never refer to one of them by that name in New Orleans. Otherwise, you may be forced to purchase that privilege with some of your blood from probably a thousand men. And perhaps still gently, perhaps now even with something of pity, that pessimistic and sardonic cerebral pity of the intelligent for any human injustice or folly or suffering. Not whores, and not whores because of us, the thousands. We, the thousand, the white men, made them, created, and produced them. We even made the laws which declare that one-eighth of a specified kind of blood shall outweigh seven-eighths of another kind. I admit that. But that same white race would have made them slaves, too. Laborers, cooks, maybe even field hands, if it were not for this thousand, these few men, like myself, without principles or honor either, perhaps you will say, we cannot, perhaps we do not even want to save all of them, perhaps the thousand we save are not one in a thousand, but we save that one, God may mark every sparrow, but we do not pretend to be God, you see. Perhaps we do not even want to be God, since no man would want but one of these sparrows, and perhaps when God looks into one of these establishments, like you saw tonight, he would not choose one of us to be God either, now that he is old. Though he must have been young once, surely he was young once, and surely someone who has existed as long as he has, who has looked at as much crude and promiscuous sinning without grace or restraint or decorum as he has had to, to contemplate at last, even though the instances are not one in a thousand thousand, the principles of honor, decorum, and gentleness applied to perfectly normal human instinct, which you Anglo-Saxons insist upon calling lust, 
and in whose service you revert in sabbaticals to the primordial caverns, the fall from what you call grace, fogged and clouded by heaven-defying words of extenuation and explanation, the return to grace heralded by heaven-placating cries of satiated abasement and flagellation, in neither of which the defiance or the placation can heaven find interest, or even after the first two or three times, diversion. So perhaps, now that God is an old man, he is not interested in the way we serve what you call lust, either. Perhaps he does not even require of us that we save this one sparrow any more than we save the one sparrow which we do save for any commendation from him. But we do save that one who but for us would have been sold to any brute who had the price not sold to him for the night like a white prostitute, but body and soul for life to him, who could have used her with more impunity than he would dare to use an animal, heifer or mayor, and then discarded or sold or even murdered when worn out or when her keep and her price no longer balanced. Yes, a sparrow which God himself neglected to mark, because though men white men created her, God did not stop it. He planted the seed which brought her to flower, the white blood to give the shape and pigment of what the white man calls female beauty, to a female principle which existed queenly and complete in the hot equatorial groin of the world long before that white one of ours came down from trees and lost its hair and bleached out a principle apt, docile, and instinct with strange and ancient curious pleasures of the flesh, which is all, there is nothing else, which her white sisters of a mushroom yesterday flee from in moral and outraged horror, a principle which, where her white sister must needs try to make an economic matter of it, like someone who insists upon installing a counter or a scales or a safe in a store or business for a certain percentage of the profits, reigns, wise, supine, and all-powerful from the sunless and silken bed which is her throne. No, not whores, not even courtesans, creatures taken at childhood, culled and chosen, and raised more carefully than any white girl, any nun, than any blooded mayor even, by a person who gives them the unsleeping care and attention which no mother ever gives. For a price, of course, but a price offered and accepted or declined through a system more formal than any that white girls are sold under, since they are more valuable as commodities than white girls, raised and trained to fulfill a woman's sole end and purpose, to love, to be beautiful, to divert, never to see a man's face hardly until brought to the ball and offered to and chosen by some man who in return not can and not will but must supply her with the surroundings proper in which to love and be beautiful and divert and who must usually risk his life, or at least his blood, for that privilege. No, not whores. Sometimes I believe that they are the only true, chaste women, not to say virgins, in America, and they remain true and faithful to that man, not merely until he dies or frees them, but until they die. And where will you find whore or lady, either, whom you can count on to do that? And Henry, but you married her, you married her. And Bon, it would be a little quicker now, sharper now, though still gentle, still patient, though still the iron, the steel, the gambler not quite yet reduced to his final trump. Ah, that ceremony, I see, that's it then, a formula, a shibboleth, meaningless as a child's game, performed by someone created by the situation whose need it answered, a crone mumbling in a dungeon lighted by a handful of burning hair, something in a tongue which not even the girls themselves understand anymore, maybe not even the crone herself, 
rooted in nothing of economics for her or for any possible progeny, since the very fact that we acquiesced, suffered the farce, was her proof and assurance of that which the ceremony itself could never enforce, vesting no new rights in any one, denying to none the old, a ritual as meaningless as that of college boys in secret rooms at night, even to the same archaic and forgotten symbols, you call that a marriage? When the night of a honeymoon and the casual business with a hired prostitute consists of the same suzerainty over a temporarily private room, the same order of removing the same clothes, the same conjunction in a single bed, why not call that a marriage too? And Henry, oh, I know. I know, you give me two and two, and you tell me it makes five, and it does make five. But there is still the marriage. Suppose I assume an obligation to a man who cannot speak my language, the obligation stated to him in his own, and I agree to it. Am I any the less obligated because I did not happen to know the tongue in which he accepted me in good faith? No, the more, the more. And Bon, the trump now, the voice gentle now, have you forgot that this woman, this child, are niggers? You, Henry Sutpin of Sutpin's Hundred in Mississippi, you talking of marriage, a wedding here? And Henry, the despair now, the last bitter cry of irrevocable undefeat, yes, I know, I know that, but it's still there, it's not right. Not even you doing it makes it right. Not even you. So that was all. It should have been all. That afternoon, four years later, should have happened the next day. The four years, the interval, mere anticlimax. An attenuation and prolongation of a conclusion already ripe to happen by the war, by a stupid and bloody aberration in the high and impossible destiny of the United States may be instigated by that family fatality which possessed, along with all circumstance, that curious lack of economy between cause and effect, which is always a characteristic of fate when reduced to using human beings for tools, material. Anyway, Henry waited four years, holding the three of them in that abeyance, that durance, waiting, uh, hoping for Barn to renounce the woman and dissolve the marriage which he, Henry, admitted was no marriage, and which he must have known as soon as he saw the woman and the child that Barn would not renounce. In fact, as time passed and Henry became accustomed to the idea of that ceremony which was still no marriage, that may have been the trouble with Henry, not the two ceremonies, but the two women. Not the fact that Bond's intention was to commit bigamy, but that it was apparently to make his, Henry's, sister, a sort of junior partner in a harem. Anyway, he waited, hoped, for four years. That spring they returned north into Mississippi. Bull Run had been fought, and there was a company organizing at the university among the student body. Henry and Bond joined it. Probably Henry wrote Judith where they were and what they intended to do. They enlisted together, you see, Henry watching Bon and Bon permitting himself to be watched, the probation, the durance, the one who dared not let the other out of his sight, not from fear that Bon would marry Judith with Henry not there to stop it, but that Bon would marry Judith and then he, Henry, would have to live for the rest of his life with the knowledge that he was glad that he had been so betrayed, with the coward's joy of surrendering without having been vanquished. The other, for that same reason, too, who could not have wanted Judith without Henry, since he must never have doubted but what he could marry Judith when he wished, in spite of brother and father both because, as I said before, it was not Judith who was the object of Bond's love or of Henry's solicitude. She was just the blank shape, the empty vessel in which each of them strove to preserve not the illusion of himself nor his illusion of the other, but what each conceived the other to believe him to be, the man and the youth, 
seducer and seduced, who had known one another, seduced and been seduced, victimized in turn each by the other, conqueror vanquished by his own strength, vanquished conquering by his own weakness, before Judith came into their joint lives, even by so much as girl name. And who knows? There was the war now. Who knows but what the fatality and the fatality's victims did not both think, hope, that the war would settle the matter, leave free one of the two irreconcilables, since it would not be the first time that youth had taken catastrophe as a direct act of providence for the sole purpose of solving a personal problem which youth itself could not solve. And Judith, how else to explain her but this way? Surely Bond could not have corrupted her to fatalism in twelve days, who not only had not tried to corrupt her to unchastity, but not even to defy her father. No, anything but a fatalist, who was the Sutpin with the ruthless Sutpin code of taking what it wanted provided it was strong enough, of the two children, as Henry was the cold field with the cold field cluttering of morality and rules of right and wrong, who, while Henry screamed and vomited, looked down from the loft that night on the spectacle of Sutpin fighting half-naked with one of his half-naked niggers, with the same cold and attentive interest with which Sutpin would have watched Henry fighting with a negro boy of his own age and weight, because she could not have known the reason for her father's objection to the marriage. Henry would not have told her, and she would not have asked her father because even if she had known it, it would have made no difference to her. She would have acted as Sutpin would have acted with anyone who tried to cross him. She would have taken Barn anyway. I can imagine her, if necessary, even murdering the other woman. But she certainly would have made no investigation and then held a moral debate between what she wanted and what she thought was right. Yet she waited... She waited four years with no word from him save through Henry that he, Bon, was alive because Henry would not let Bon write her. He would not have, and Bon would not have tried to. It was the probation, the durance, they all three accepted it. I don't believe there was ever any promise between Henry and Bon demanded or offered but Judith, who could not have known what happened, nor why. Have you noticed how so often when we try to reconstruct the causes which lead up to the actions of men and women, how, with a sort of astonishment, we find ourselves now and then reduced to the belief, the only possible belief, that they stemmed from some of the old virtues, the thief who steals not for greed but for love, the murderer who kills not out of lust but pity, Judith giving implicit trust where she had given love, giving implicit love where she had derived breath and pride, that true pride, not the false kind which transforms what it does not at the moment understand into scorn and outrage, and so vents itself in pique and lacerations, but true pride which can say to itself without abasement, I love, I will accept no substitute, Something has happened between him and my father. If my father was right, I will never see him again. If wrong, he will come or send for me. If happy I can be, I will. If suffer I must, I can. Because she waited, she made no effort to do anything else. Her relations with her father had not altered one jot. To see them together, Bon might never have even existed. Between that Christmas day and the day when Sutpin rode away with his and Sartorius's regiment, they didn't talk, tell one another anything, you see. Sutpin, what he had learned about Bon, Judith, that she knew where Bon and Henry now were, they did not need to talk. They were too much alike. They were as two people become now and then who seem to know one another so well or are so much alike that the power, the need to communicate by speech atrophies from disuse, and comprehending without need of the medium of ear or intellect, they no longer understand one another's actual words. 
so she did not tell him where Henry and Bond were, and he did not discover it until after the university company departed, because Bond and Henry enrolled and then hid themselves somewhere. They must have. They must have paused in Oxford only long enough to enroll before riding on, because no one who knew them, either in Oxford or in Jefferson, knew that they were members of the company at the time, which would have been almost impossible to conceal otherwise, because now people, fathers and mothers and sisters and kin and sweethearts of those young men, were coming to Oxford from further away than Jefferson, families with food and bedding and servants, to bivouac among the families, the houses of Oxford itself, to watch the gallant mimic marching and countermarching of the sons and the brothers, drawn all of them, rich and poor, aristocrat and redneck, by what is probably the most moving mass sight of all human mass experience, far more so than the spectacle of so many virgins going to be sacrificed to some heathen principle, some priapus, the sight of young men, the light quick bones, the bright gallant deluded blood and flesh dressed in a martial glitter of brass and plumes, marching away to a battle. And there would be music at night, fiddle and triangle among the blazing candles, the blowing of curtains in tall windows on the April darkness, the swing of crinoline indiscriminate within the circle of plain gray cuff of the soldier, or the banded gold of rank, of an army, even if not a war of gentlemen, where private and colonel called each other by their given names, not as one farmer to another across a halted plough in a field, or across a counter in a store laden with calico and cheese and strap oil, but as one man to another above the suave, powdered shoulders of women, above the two raised glasses of scuppernong claret or bought champagne. Music, the nightly repetitive last waltz as the days passed and the company waited to move, the brave, trivial glitter against a black night not catastrophic but merely background, the perennial last scented spring of youth, and Judith not there, and Henry the romantic not there, and Bond the fatalist hidden somewhere, the watcher and the watch, and the recurrent flower-laden dawns of that April and May and June filled with bugles, entering a hundred windows where a hundred still unbrided widows dreamed virgin unmeditant upon the locks of black or brown or yellow hair, and Judith not one of these, and five of the company, mounted with grooms and body servants in a forage wagon in their new and unstained gray, made a tour of the state with the flag, the company's colors, the segments of silk cut and fitted but not sewn, from house to house, until the sweetheart of each man in the company had taken a few stitches in it. And Henry and Bon, not of these either, since they did not join the company until after it departed, who must have emerged from whatever place it was that they lurked in, emerging as though unnoticed from the roadside brake or thicket, to fall in as the marching company passed. The two of them, the youth and the man, the youth deprived twice now of his birthright, who should have made one among the candles and fiddles, the kisses and the desperate tears, who should have made one of the color guard itself which toured the state with the unsown flag, and the man who should not have been there at all, who was too old to be there at all, both in years and experience, that mental and spiritual orphan whose fate it apparently was to exist in some limbo, halfway between where his corporeality was and his mentality and moral equipment desired to be. An undergraduate at the university, yet by the sheer accumulation of two full years behind him, forced into the extra-academic of a law class containing six members. In the war, by that same force, removed into the isolation of commissioned rank, 
He received a lieutenancy before the company entered its first engagement, even. I don't think he wanted it. I can even imagine him trying to avoid it, refuse it. But there it was, he was, orphaned once more by the very situation to which and by which he was doomed. The two of them, officer and man, now but still watcher and watched, waiting for something but not knowing what, what act of fate, destiny, what irrevocable sentence of what judge or arbiter between them, since nothing less would do, nothing halfway or reversible would seem to suffice. The officer, the lieutenant who possessed the slight and authorized advantage of being able to say, you, go there, of at least sometimes remaining behind the platoon which he directed, the private who carried that officer shot through the shoulder on his back, while the regiment fell back under the Yankee guns at Pittsburgh Landing, carried him to safety apparently for the sole purpose of watching him for two years more, writing Judith meanwhile that they were both alive, and that was all. And Judith. She lived alone now, perhaps she had lived alone ever since that Christmas day last year, and then year before last, and then three years, and then four years ago, since, though Sutpin was gone now with his and Sartorius's regiment and the Negroes, the wild stock with which he had created Sutpin's hundred, had followed the first Yankee troops to pass through Jefferson, she lived in anything but solitude, what with Ellen in bed in the shuttered room, requiring the unremitting attention of a child, while she waited with that amazed and passive uncomprehension to die, and she, Judith, and Clytie, making and keeping a kitchen garden of sorts to keep them alive, and Wash Jones, living in the abandoned and rotting fishing camp in the river bottom which Sutpin had built after the first woman, Ellen, entered his house, and the last deer and bear hunter went out of it, where he now permitted Wash and his daughter and infant granddaughter to live, performing the heavy garden work and supplying Ellen and Judith, and then Judith, with fish and game now and then, even entering the house now, who, until Sutpin went away, had never approached nearer than the Scuppernong arbor behind the kitchen, where on Sunday afternoons he and Sutpin would drink from the demijohn, and the bucket of spring water, which Wash fetched from almost a mile away, Sutpin in the barrel stave hammock, talking, and Wash squatting against a post, chortling and guffawing, not solitude and certainly not idleness, the same impenetrable and serene face, only a little older now, a little thinner now, which had appeared in town in the carriage beside her father's, within a week after it was learned that her fiancé and her brother had quitted the house in the night and vanished, none knew why or where, and none asked, just as now none asked when she came to town now in the made-over dress which all southern women now wore, in the carriage still, but drawn now by a mule, a plough-mule, soon the plough-mule and no coachman to drive it either, to put the mule in the harness and take it out, to join the other women where there were wounded in Jefferson then, in the improvised hospital where the nurtured virgin, the supremely and traditionally idle, they cleaned and dressed the self-fouled bodies of strange injured and dead, and made lint of the window curtains and sheets and linen of the houses in which they had been born, none to ask her about brother and sweetheart while they talked among themselves of sons and brothers and husbands, with tears and grief perhaps, but at least with certainty, knowledge, she waiting too, like Henry and Bon, not knowing for what, but unlike Henry and Bon, she not even knowing for why. Then Ellen died, the butterfly of a forgotten summer, two years defunctive now, the substanceless shell, the shade impervious to any alteration or dissolution because of its very weightlessness. No body to be buried, just the shape, the recollection, translated on some peaceful afternoon without bell or catafalque into that cedar grove, 
to lie in powder-like paradox beneath the thousand pounds of marble monument which Sutpin, Colonel Sutpin now, since Sartorius had been deposed at the annual election of regimental officers the year before, brought in the regimental forage wagon from Charleston, South Carolina, and set above the faint grassy depression which Judith told him was Ellen's grave. And then her grandfather died, starved to death, nailed up in his own attic, and Judith doubtless inviting Miss Rosa to come out to Sutpin's Hundred to live, and Miss Rosa declining, waiting too, apparently, upon this letter, this first direct word from Barn in four years, and which a week after she buried him too, beside her mother's tombstone, she brought to town herself, in the Surrey drawn by the mule which both she and Clytie had learned to catch and harness, and gave to your grandmother, bringing the letter voluntarily to your grandmother, who, Judith, never called on anyone now, had no friends now, doubtless knowing no more why she chose your grandmother to give the letter to than your grandmother knew. Not thin now, but gaunt, the Sutpin skull showing indeed now through the worn, the cold field flesh, the face which had long since forgotten how to be young, and yet absolutely impenetrable, absolutely serene, no mourning, not even grief, and your grandmother saying, me? You want me to keep it? Yes, Judith said, or destroy it as you like. Read it if you like, or don't read it if you like, because you make so little impression, you see. You get born, and you try this, and you don't know why, only you keep on trying it, and you are born at the same time with a lot of other people, all mixed up with them, like trying to, having to, move your arms and legs with strings, only the same strings are hitched to all the other arms and legs, and the others all trying, and they don't know why either, except that the strings are all in one another's way, like five or six people, all trying to make a rug on the same loom. Only each one wants to weave his own pattern into the rug, and it can't matter, you know that, or the ones that set up the loom would have arranged things a little better. And yet it must matter because you keep on trying or having to keep on trying. And then all of a sudden, it's all over. And all you have left is a block of stone with scratches on it, provided there was someone to remember to have the marble scratched and set up or had time to. And it rains on it. And the sun shines on it. And after a while, they don't even remember the name and what the scratches were trying to tell. And it doesn't matter. And so maybe, if you could go to someone, the stranger the better, and give them something, a scrap of paper, something, anything, it not to mean anything in itself, and them not even to read it or keep it, not even bother to throw it away or destroy it, at least it would be something, just because it would have happened. Be remembered even if only from passing from one hand to another, one mind to another and it would be at least a scratch, something, something that might make a mark on something that was once, for the reason that it can die some day, while the block of stone can't be is, because it never can become was, because it can't ever die or perish. And your grandmother watching her, the impenetrable, the calm, the absolutely serene face, and crying, No, no, not that. Think of your... And the face watching her, comprehending, still serene, not even bitter. Oh, I? No, not that. Because somebody will have to take care of Clytie and father too soon, who will want something to eat after he comes home, because it won't last much longer since they have begun to shoot one another now. No, not that. Women don't do that for love. I don't even believe that men do. And not now, anyway, because there wouldn't be any room now for them to go to, wherever it is, if it is. It would be full already, glutted, like a theater, an opera house, if what you expect to find is forgetting, diversion, entertainment. Like a bed, already too full, if what you want to find is a chance to lie still and sleep and sleep 
and sleep. Mr. Conson moved. Half rising, Quentin took the letter from him, and beneath the dim, bug-fouled globe, opened it carefully, as though the sheet, the desiccated square, were not the paper, but the intact ash of its former shape and substance. And meanwhile, Mr. Comson's voice speaking on while Quentin heard it without listening. Now you can see why I said that he loved her, because there were other letters, many of them, gallant, flowery, indolent, frequent, and insincere, sent by hand over that forty miles between Oxford and Jefferson after that first Christmas, the metropolitan gallant's idle and delicately flattering and doubtless to him meaningless gesture to the bucolic maiden, and that bucolic maiden with that profound and absolutely inexplicable, tranquil, patient clairvoyance of women against which that metropolitan gallant's foppish posturing was just the jackanape antics of a small boy, receiving the letters without understanding them, not even keeping them for all their elegant and gallant and tediously contrived turns of form and metaphor, until the next one arrived, but keeping this one, which must have reached her out of a clear sky after an interval of four years, considering this one worthy to give to a stranger to keep, or not to keep, even to read or not to read as the stranger saw fit, to make that scratch, that undying mark on the blank face of the oblivion to which we are all doomed, of which she spoke. Quentin, hearing, without having to listen as he read the faint spidery script, not like something impressed upon the paper by a once living hand, but like a shadow cast upon it which had resolved on the paper the instant before he looked at it, and which might fade, vanish at any instant while he still did, the dead tongue speaking after the four years, and then after almost fifty more, gentle, sardonic, whimsical, and incurably pessimistic, without date or salutation or signature. You will notice how I insult neither of us by claiming this to be a voice from the defeated even, let alone from the dead. In fact, if I were a philosopher, I should deduce and derive a curious and apt commentary on the times and augur of the future from this letter which you now hold in your hands a sheet of notepaper with, as you can see, the best of French watermarks, dated seventy years ago, salvaged, stolen, if you will, from the gutted mansion of a ruined aristocrat, and written upon in the best of stove polish, manufactured not twelve months ago in a New England factory. Yes, stove polish. We captured it. A story in itself. Imagine us, an assortment of homogeneous scarecrows, I won't say hungry, because to a woman, lady, or female either, below Masons and Dixons in this year of grace 1865, that word would be sheer redundancy, like saying that we were breathing. And I won't say ragged or even shoeless, since we have been both long enough to have grown accustomed to it. Only thank God, and this restores my faith, not in human nature perhaps, but at least in man, that he really does not become inured to hardship and privation. It is only the mind, the gross, omnivorous, carrion-heavy soul which becomes inured. The body itself, thank God, never reconciled from the old soft feel of soap and clean linen and something between the sole of the foot and the earth to distinguish it from the foot of a beast. So say we merely needed ammunition, and imagine us, the scarecrows, with one of those concocted plans of scarecrow desperation, which not only must but do work, for the reason that there is absolutely no room for alternative before man or heaven, no niche on earth or under it for failure to find space either to pause or breathe or be graved and sepulchred, and we, the scarecrows, bringing it off with a great deal of élan, not to say noise, 
Imagine, I say, the prey and prize, the ten plump, defenseless, subtler's wagons, the scarecrows tumbling out, box after beautiful box after beautiful box, stenciled each with that U and that S, which for four years now has been to us the symbol of the spoils which belong to the vanquished, of the loaves and the fishes as was once the incandescent brow, the shining nimbus of the thorny crown, and the scarecrows clawing at the boxes with stones and bayonets and even with bare hands, and opening them at last and finding what? Stove polish. Gallons and gallons and gallons of the best stove polish. Not a box of it a year old yet and doubtless still trying to overtake General Sherman with some belated amended field order requiring him to polish the stove before firing the house, how we laughed. Yes, we laughed, because I have learned this at least during these four years, that it really requires an empty stomach to laugh with, that only when you are hungry or frightened do you extract some ultimate essence out of laughing just as the empty stomach extracts the ultimate essence out of alcohol. But at least we have stove polish. We have plenty of it. We have too much, because it does not take much to say what I have to say, as you can see. And so the conclusion and augury which I draw, even though no philosopher, is this. We have waited long enough. You will notice that I do not insult you either by saying, I have waited long enough, and therefore, since I do not insult you by saying that only I have waited, I do not add, expect me, because I cannot say when to expect me, because what was is one thing, and now it is not, because it is dead. It died in 1861, and therefore what is, there, they have started firing again, which, to mention it, is redundancy too like the breathing or the need of ammunition, because sometimes I think it has never stopped. It hasn't stopped, of course. I don't mean that. I mean, there has never been any more of it, that there was but one fusillade four years ago, which sounded once and then was arrested, mesmerized, raised muzzle by raised muzzle, in the frozen attitude of its own aghast amazement, and never repeated, and it now only the loud, aghast echo jarred by the dropped musket of a weary sentry or by the fall of the spent body itself out of the air which lies over the land where that fusillade first sounded and where it must remain yet because no other space under heaven will receive it. So that means that it is dawn again and that I must stop. Stop what, you will say? Why, thinking remembering, remark that I do not say hoping, to become once more for a period without boundaries or location in time, mindless and irrational companion, and inmate of a body which, even after four years, with a sort of dismal and incorruptible fidelity, which is incredibly admirable to me, is still immersed and obliviously bemused in recollections of old peace and contentment, the very names of whose scents and sounds I do not know that I remember, which ignores even the presence and threat of a torn arm or leg, as though through some secretly incurred and infallible promise and conviction of immortality. But to finish, I cannot say when to expect me, because what is is something else again, because it was not even alive then, and since, because within this sheet of paper you now hold the best of the Old South which is dead, and the words you read were written upon it with the best, each box said, the very best, of the new North which has conquered and which therefore, whether it likes it or not, will have to survive, I now believe that you and I are, strangely enough, included among those who are doomed to live. And that's all, Mr. Compson said. She received it, and she and Clytie made the wedding gown and the veil from scraps. 
perhaps scraps intended for, which should have gone for lint and did not. She didn't know when he would come because he didn't know himself. And maybe he told Henry, showed Henry the letter before he sent it, and maybe he did not. Maybe still just the watching and the waiting. The one saying to Henry, I have waited long enough. And Henry saying to the other, Do you renounce then? Do you renounce? And the other saying, I do not renounce. For four years now I have given chance the opportunity to renounce for me, but it seems that I am doomed to live, that she and I both are doomed to live. The defiance and the ultimatum delivered beside a bivouac fire, and the ultimatum discharged before the gate to which the two of them must have ridden side by side almost, the one calm and undeviating, perhaps unresisting even, the fatalist to the last, the other remorseless with implacable and unalterable grief and despair. It seemed to Quentin that he could actually see them facing one another at the gate. Inside the gate, what was once a park now spread, unkempt in shaggy desolation, with an air dreamy, remote, and aghast, like the unshaven face of a man just waking from ether, up to a huge house where a young girl waited in a wedding dress made from stolen scraps, the house partaking too of that air of scaling desolation, not having suffered from invasion, but a shell marooned and forgotten in a backwater of catastrophe, a skeleton giving of itself in slow driblets of furniture and carpet, linen and silver, to help to die torn and anguished men who knew even while dying that for months now the sacrifice and the anguish were in vain. They faced one another on the two gaunt horses, Two men, young, not yet in the world, not yet breathed over long enough to be old, but with old eyes, with unkempt hair and faces, gaunt and weathered, as if cast by some Spartan and even niggard hand from bronze, in worn and patched gray, weathered now to the color of dead leaves, the one with the tarnished braid of an officer, the other plain of cuff, the pistol lying yet across the saddle-bow, unaimed, the two faces calm, the voices not even raised. Don't you pass the shadow of this post, this branch, Charles, and I am going to pass it, Henry. And then Wash Jones, sitting that saddleless mule before Miss Rose's gate, shouting her name into the sunny and peaceful quiet of the street, saying, Air you, rosy cold field, then you better come on out, yon. Henry has done shot that darn French feller. Killed him, dead as a bee. Chapter 5 So they will have told you, doubtless, already, how I told that Jones to take that mule, which was not his, around to the barn and harness it to our buggy while I put on my hat and shawl and locked the house. That was all I needed to do, since they will have told you, doubtless, that I would have had no need for either trunk or bag, since what clothing I possess, now that the garments which I had been fortunate enough to inherit from my aunt's kindness or haste or oversight were long since worn out, consisted of the ones which Ellen had remembered from time to time to give me, and now Ellen, these two years dead, that I had only to lock the house and take my place in the buggy and traverse those twelve miles which I had not done since Ellen died, beside that brute who until Ellen died was not even permitted to approach the house from the front, that brute progenitor of brutes whose granddaughter was to supplant me if not in my sister's house, at least in my sister's bed, to which, so they will tell you, I aspired, that brute, who, brute instrument of that justice which presides over human events, which, incept in the individual, runs smooth, less claw than velvet, but which, by man or woman flouted, drives on like fiery steel and overrides both weakly just and unjust strong, 
both vanquisher and innocent victimized, ruthless for appointed right and truth, brute who was not only to preside upon the various shapes and avatars of Thomas Sutton's devil's fate, but was to provide at the last the female flesh in which his name and lineage should be sepulchred, that brute who appeared to believe that he had served and performed his appointed end by yelling of blood and pistols in the street before my house, who seemed to believe that what further information he might have given me was too scant or too bland and free of moment to warrant the discarding of his tobacco cud, because during the entire subsequent twelve miles he could not even tell me what had happened and how I traversed those same twelve miles once more after the two years since Ellen died, or was it the four years since Henry vanished, or was it the nineteen years since I saw light and breathe, knowing nothing, able to learn nothing save this, a shot heard, faint and far away, and even direction and source indeterminate, by two women, Two young women alone in a rotting house where no man's footstep had sounded in two years. A shot. Then an interval of aghast surmise above the cloth and needles which engaged them. Then feet in the hall and then on the stairs, running, hurrying, the feet of a man. And Judith with just time to snatch up the unfinished dress and hold it before her as the door burst open upon her brother the wild murderer whom she had not seen in four years, and whom she believed to be, if he was, still lived and breathed at all, a thousand miles away. And then the two of them, the two accursed children, on whom the first blow of their devil's heritage had but that moment fallen, looking at one another across the upraised and unfinished wedding dress, Twelve miles toward that I rode, beside an animal who could stand in the street before my house and bellow placidly to the populace and listening solitude that my nephew had just murdered his sister's fiancé, yet who could not permit himself to force the mule which drew us beyond a walk, because it want none of mine nor his'n neither, and besides it ain't had a decent bait of victuals since the corn give out in February who, turning into the actual gate at night, must stop the mule and, pointing with the whip and spitting first, say, It was right yonder. What was right there, fool? I cried, and he, It was, until I took the whip from him into my own hand and struck the mule. But they cannot tell you how I went on up the drive, past Ellen's ruined and weed-choked flower beds, and reached the house, the shell, the so I thought cocoon casket marriage bed of youth and grief, and found that I had come not too late as I had thought, but come too soon. Rotting portico and scaling walls it stood, not ravaged, not invaded, marked by no bullet nor soldier's iron heel, but rather as though reserved for something more, some desolation more profound than ruin, as if it had stood in iron juxtaposition to iron flame, to a holocaust which had found itself less fierce and less implacable, not hurled, but rather fallen back before the impervious and indomitable skeleton which the flames durst not, at the instant's final crisis, assail. There was even one step, one plank rotted free and tilting beneath the foot, or would have if I had not touched it light and fast, as I ran up and into the hallway, whose carpet had long since gone with the bed and table linen for lint, and saw the suckpin face, and even as I cried, Henry, Henry, what have you done? What has that fool been trying to tell me? Realized that I had come not too late as I had thought, but come too soon, because it was not Henry's face. It was suckpin face enough, but not his. Sutpin coffee-colored face enough there in the dim light, barring the stairs, and I running out of the bright afternoon into the thunderous silence of that brooding house where I could see nothing at first. Then gradually the face, 
the sutpen face, not approaching, not swimming up out of the gloom, but already there, rock-like and firm and antedating time and house and doom and all, waiting there. Oh, yes, he chose well. He bettered choosing who created in his own image the cold Cerberus of his private hell, the face without sex or age because it had never possessed either, the same sphinx face which she had been born with, which had looked down from the loft that night beside Judith's, and which she still wears now at seventy-four, looking at me with no change, no alteration in it at all, as though it had known to the second when I was to enter, had waited there during that entire twelve miles behind that walking mule and watched me draw nearer and nearer and enter the door at last, as it had known, I perhaps decreed, since there is that justice whose Moloch's pallet paunch makes no distinction between gristle bone and tender flesh, that I should. The face stopping me dead, not my body, it still advanced, ran on, but I myself, that deep existence which we lead, to which the movement of limbs is but a clumsy and belated accompaniment, like so many unnecessary instruments played crudely and amateurishly out of time to the tune itself, in that barren hall with its naked stare, that carpet gone too, rising into the dim upper hallway where an echo spoke which was not mine, but rather that of the lost, irrevocable might have been which haunts all houses, all enclosed walls erected by human hands, not for shelter, not for warmth, but to hide from the world's curious looking and seeing the dark turnings which the ancient young delusions of pride and hope and ambition, I and love, too, take. Judith, I said, Judith. There was no answer. I had expected none, possibly even then I did not expect Judith to answer, just as a child, before the full instant of comprehended terror, calls on the parent whom it actually knows, this before the terror destroys all judgment whatever, is not even there to hear it. I was crying not to someone, something, but trying to cry through something, through that force that furious yet absolutely rock-like and immobile antagonism which had stopped me, that presence, that familiar coffee-colored face, that body, the bare coffee-colored feet motionless on the bare floor, the curve of the stair rising just beyond her, no larger than mine own, which, without moving, with no alteration of visual displacement whatever, she did not even remove her gaze from mine for the reason that she was not looking at me, but through me, apparently still musing upon the open door's serene rectangle which I had broken, seemed to elongate and project upward something, not soul, not spirit, but something rather of a profoundly attentive and distracted listening to, as for something which I myself could not hear and was not intended to hear, a brooding awareness and acceptance of the inexplicable unseen inherited from an older and a purer race than mine, which created, postulated, and shaped in the empty air between us that which I believed I had come to find, nay, which I must find, else breathing and standing there I would have denied that I was ever born, that bedroom, long closed and musty, that sheetless bed, that nuptial couch of love and grief, with the pale and bloody corpse in its patched and weathered grey, crimsoning the bare mattress, the bowed and unwived widow kneeling beside it. And I, my body, not stopping yet, yes, it needed the hand, the touch for that, I, self-mesmered fool, who still believed that what must be would be, could not but be, else I must deny sanity as well as breath, running, 
hurling myself into that inscrutable coffee-colored face, that cold, implacable, mindless, no, not mindless, anything but mindless, his own clairvoyant will tempered to amoral evils undeviating absolute by the black willing blood with which he had crossed it, replica of his own which he had created and decreed to preside upon his absence, as you might watch a wild, distracted, night-bound bird flutter into the brazen and fatal lamp. Wait, she said, don't you go up there. Still I did not stop. It would require the hand, and I, still running on, accomplishing those last few feet across which we seemed to glare at one another, not as two faces, but as the two abstract contradictions which we actually were. Neither of our voices raised as though we spoke to one another free of the limitations and restrictions of speech and hearing. What? I said. 